happen to you? You are going to be our lord and saviour. You shame your race, traitor! The Dawn of War franchise by far is one of the most recognisable and loved series of Warhammer games ever. If you loved the Warhammer hobby back in the day, seeing this game for the first time, transforming those miniatures you play with on a table into a computer game where you could actually see, control and fight with blood and gore animations was glorious. Even if you had never played or heard of Warhammer, this game was still beyond its time. From the excellent animations of units fighting each other, to the superb voice acting that to this day some AAA games can't even match. The story was strong and had a good grip on you from the start. The music created to this day is still listened to by Warhammer fans when painting or building in the hobby. The variety of races in the game made it feel like every match was different and this came out in 2004 and still has people playing it to this day. The game was so popular that it brought new people into the Warhammer hobby. That is easily done. And even allowed the publisher to make new DLC for the next four years. Obviously some were better than others, but nonetheless, Dawn of War was a great game, and has stood the test of time of being one of the best and greatest real-time strategy games ever. Fast forward to 2009, and you have the sequel to the first game, Dawn of War 2. I know, right? Original name. Whilst it was not as big in battles or had base building, Dawn of War 2 traded those out for better graphics, a cover-based system, and more micro-intensive gameplay where you're trying to control multiple small, powerful units with different abilities to outwit your enemy. While some people preferred Dawn of War 1 and some people preferred number 2, no one on either side could deny that Dawn of War did what it does well. It did so well in fact, that once again it brought people into the Warhammer hobby who had never played before, which also meant Games Workshop basically sanctioned Relic to make more DLC for this game, and once again this sold well. New races meant people of the hobby were getting their favourite factions onto the computer screen and for veteran players it was something new to tackle against to keep them interested in the game. People were throwing money at Dawn of War 2 and it could have easily carried on doing this. In 2016 we got our last content added to Dawn of War 2, the Necron Overlord. This got a lot of people hyped for what was to come as a lot of people were eagerly waiting and speculating for what the next game might bring in the franchise. In May 2nd of 2016, we finally got our prayers answered. Dawn of War 3 could not have started better, with the first teaser saying that a full trailer was going to be dropped the next day, getting everybody more hyped than when Xenos actually get love in the hobby. Yum! And Relic certainly did not disappoint. The trailer was everything and more. It had blood, grim dark, horror, fog of war, and to this day is still one of the best representations of the 40k universe. It showed our three main races that we've come to love in the Dawn of War franchise, Space Marine, Orcs and Eldar, and gave us a tease of what was to come in the game, showing Wraith Knights and Imperial Knights battling each other. There was also criticism on the Space Marine size ratios with their legs being a little too long, but people ignored this as it was only a minor problem. The game promised to have base building and big battles of Dawn of War 1, with the hero units from Dawn of War 2, pleasing both sides. Nothing could stop Relic now from showing off the first gameplay of the game everyone wanted. I have to say that this is pre-alpha footage, so certain visual, audio and UI elements are meant to change as we gear up for release next year. Sweet! It means we've got some changes coming to Dawn of War 3 at some point! Yay! They're gonna fix the problems! Yay! Kill me. Honestly, since this was Sega, it would have been nice that Dawn of War 3 got the Sonic treatment. Brothers, the Emperor protects! The Dawn of War 3 first gameplay impression showed us playing as Gabriel Angelos, but everything was acceptable so far, but see if you can spot the point where it all went to shit. And then an ability called God Splitter, named after his hammer, which allows him to jump over what gaps. The fuck? It was at this very moment that the internet went berserk. People on Reddit tried to work out how this was possible. People consulted their Black Library books and their local Games Workshop manager on how this was possible. In the whole of Warhammer 40k lore, there had never been a sentence that Somersault Flip and Power Armor had been in together. Of course, this was the first of many problems with Dawn of War 3, but I feel it was the one that really set this game's course in a bad direction. And don't worry, I will be covering the rest as well. The 
advertisement for Dawn of War 3 was awful. Whoever was on the marketing team had good ideas, but terrible executions, which resulted in really cringy videos, two of which I'm going to react to now. Alright, let's go. Are you both going to play without a lead to the beginning of the game? I mean, probably. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not a good idea. <laughs> My dread's going down, my dread's going down. Can you do anything? Dude, hold, hold, I'm coming. I'm bringing my wraith and I didn't know. Yeah, let's be honest, lads. There was no women playing this game. It's Warhammer. Oh, nice. Chucking a grenade in there. Yeah, oh crap, a... you saved it. How the f*** did you do that? Oh, it's so painful to watch this, honestly. Oh my god. Oh, it's a double Eldritch Storm. Oh my god. You can see the red and the blue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the red and the blue! <laughs> I'm surprised I can see what the fuck's on the screen! <laughs> yeah. Coordinated this well. Okay, guys, let's go and smash their orc base. Dude, I think you're gonna lose your base. I know, I know. By the way, this isn't me editing this. They are actually cutting between different maps, but using audio as if they're playing on the same match. It's really confusing if you're watching this. I know, I need backup, I need backup. They're controlling the entire map. Well, they're clearly not. Yeah, just hit the core, hit the core. <laughs> yes. I told you, man. Yeah, I told you, man. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I told you we'd win this game. <laughs> the next video I'm going to show you is even more cringy than the last, but ten times more funnier. Hello and welcome to Dawn of War Weekly Power, and I'm on a mission to learn more about Sega and Relic Entertainment's blockbuster expert. I need a man that knows his Wraith Lords from his Wraith Guard, and that man is Chris Thurston. Hello, Simon. How are you? I'm hungry, Chris. I'm hungry for facts about Dawn of War 3. I'm hungry, Chris. I'm hungry for facts about Dawn of War 3. Well, maybe go get lunch? I mean, <laughs> it's so, so cringy. They like to cobble together scrap into crazy war machines. They're the ultimate horde army. Let's start with the humans. What's the deal with the Space Marines? Yeah, what is the deal with those Space Marines? The Space Marines are led by a Space Marine commander, Gabriel Angelos, a hero of the series who you can control on the battlefield. He's one of the Space Marine hero units. Really? Oh my god, I can't believe they actually had this in the script. This next part is possibly the most funniest and cringeworthy bit of it entirely. That's right. Dawn of War 3 gives you the big armies of the first game and mixes in these Dawn of War 2 style hero units. There are a bunch for each army and you pick three before a battle starts. What can they do that your normal guys can't? What can they do that your normal guys can't? It's, it's honestly like somebody was holding up a piece of paper in front of him, like pointing to it, like, read this. It's just so funny. We'll throw up a shield that reflects gunfire. He's a close combat specialist. But if you wanted to take a different tactical approach, you could pick a ranged support specialist like Jonah, the chapter librarian. What's he going to do? Loan them a book? Uh, 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 I can't even comment on it. No, but he can trap enemies in a psychic cage. Librarians are very different in Warhammer 40,000. That's crazy. That's crazy. You can really hear the shock in his voice, can't you? That's crazy. If you like that, check out this elite. A big stompy death robot. That's more like it. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt, all right? He may not know the lore, okay? That's, that's probably what I'm going to do here. I like what I'm seeing, but I can't help but notice the lack of enormous robots. Remember the wraith blades we saw earlier? The deadly horned bone dudes. Here's their big brother. Now that's what I'm talking about. Can you seriously imagine someone writing this? Can you? <laughs> so... Okay, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, the, uh, the animations are crazy in this game. I mean, it's like at the level of like a third person action game where it's like real detailed just from that isometric RTS view that we're used to. Uh, a lot going on. There's just complete chaos almost, right? Yeah, exactly my thoughts as well, Angry Joe. But it's war. It's supposed to be, you know, a little hectic in there. So I can't wait to get my hands on it. Well, we're still waiting on that fucking review. So I hope you get it out soon. As I said, the marketing team had good intentions. They even invited some YouTubers out to their HQ. But the choice of YouTubers, however, was not great in my opinion. The Yodcast guy, Sige... Jin Jizz, I don't even know his name, has one Warhammer video on his channel, and it's a Dawn of War 3 one. I bet he didn't even play the game when it came out. Truly a horrible pick. The other two, Luton and Captain Shack, actually make regular Warhammer content, so it's fair having them, but obviously they played it safe and did not ask questions about things that people wanted to know. Which I can understand because you want to be nice and get invited back again. Uh, I loved it. Loved it to bits. Um, I, I was kind of curious where it was going to land in between uh, one and two. I mean, I, I'd seen things and I'd read, I'd read about things, um, but to get hands on time, I'm really glad with the direction it's gone in. It's a really, really fun experience. Well, interesting perspective. It seems many people did not share the same. 
Relic, next time you advertise for Dawn of War 4, invite YouTubers out who first of all actually play your game post-launch and care about it also. Stop with the cringy videos, it just pisses off Warhammer fans, and lastly, be more open with your community when launching. When searching for these videos, the amount of people commenting saying that you guys weren't answering questions, you know, is absolutely terrible, and just ignoring it instead of addressing it is just going to make things worse. It's a hard knock <laughs> I don't know why this one made me laugh so much. This guy's the MVP, man. He, he predicted this shit. Show me what passes for fury among your misbegotten kind. Voice acting for Dawn of War 3 had its fair share of hate. This was mostly because of Paul Dobson not being in it. And I can't blame people. His voice was truly amazing for the role. Paul Dobson's voice once visited the Virgin Islands. They are now known as the Ar for fuck's sake. <laughs> That's crazy. One way I'm going to prove this to you is by playing a clip from Dawn of War 3, first without Paul's voice, and the second with Paul's voice lines from Dawn of War 1, and you can judge which is better. First chunk of gameplay. I'm on my way, but it's just me. Don't be reckless, wait for backup. There's no time. They'll kill you. They can try. Here in this demo. Hey everyone, this is Philip Boole, the game director for Dawn of War 3, here with the first chunk of gameplay. Brothers, let us destroy this alien filth. Don't be reckless, wait for backup. My power armor will protect. They'll kill you. I shall not die on this day. Here in this demo mission, we're starting with Gabriel Angel. Voice acting for a game is no less important than any other part, especially for an RTS where units are telling you everything they see, do, and interact with. It's important you get these right. This is the great unclean one, these are death sounds. <laughs> Dawn of War 3's voice actors, in my opinion, fit their roles very well. I won't need snake! Except Gabriel. Perhaps if this was the first Dawn of War game and we had not had a sweet taste of Paul's voice already, it would be fine. Alec Newman is not a bad voice actor, but his predecessor had set a standard that he could just not compete with. I'm Elizabeth Andrew Walther and I'm playing Lady Solaria. I am a giant bad robot. Oh dear. That's crazy. This was kind of funny actually, more to see how many people in the comments got annoyed because she called it a robot and not a mech suit. It was just so stupid, people getting triggered about this. <laughs> Overall, the voice acting for Dawn of War 3 was the least of its problems. I think many of you can agree with me, we can let that slide. However, there were some voices that were unforgivable. A long walk, but that will not trouble me. They will be wreathed in flame. Yeah, sorry, there's no forgiving that. It honestly sounds like an Eldar was shoved inside that dreadnought. Show me what passes for fury among your misbegotten kind! Show me what passes for fury among your misbegotten kind! <laughs> One of the biggest criticisms of Dawn of War 3 was its direction in the art department. Many people said the people who made the trailer knew more about Warhammer 40k than the guys making the game. Quite harsh, but no one can deny that the gameplay of Dawn of War 3 looks nothing like the grim dark trailer. But with that being said, I don't think the entire art focus of Dawn of War 3 was wrong. When you look at the game, you have to look at graphics, effects, animations, models, maps, so it's easy just to point the finger and say it was shit. However, some were definitely doing 40k justice, others were not, but without a doubt, budget was not a problem when making Dawn of War 3, so they could have gone in any direction. The graphics of Dawn of War 3 were not bad, but they looked bad. 
If you're looking at poly count and detail on assets, they were definitely high, and when it comes to RTSs, they were far far greater than previous Dawn of War games and many other RTS games. On max settings, you can see the detail on individual models, and it did require a good PC to run on those settings, so why did it look so bad? Well, for starters, the saturation was far too high. Dawn of War 1 got away with it due to its poly count being very low. Dawn of War 2 having better graphics than the first game lowered the saturation and had less bright colours, with only very few assets and effects in game having the colours on the same level as Dawn of War 3, such as buffs, debuffs and effects and explosions. This was a problem for Dawn of War 3 because when you have models that look like the highlights were made as base paints, it's very hard to make effects stand out. That's why with Dawn of War 2 it worked so well because you could show stuff easily with the bright effects over the grim dark models. I mean, everything in Dawn of War 3 looked like it was fresh out of the box and that it had never seen combat before that day. I mean, even the orcs with stuff made out of scrap looked new. Where was the Agrax Earthshade and no oil? And always remember. Apply two thin coats and thin your paints. That's crazy. I mean, out of all of the races, the only one that I felt was acceptable was the Eldar. Bright colours did fit, but with the saturation, it ruined it. Just look at this model for Gorguts using the cinematics in game from the art station. How much better does he look here with the blood, the dirt, and the scratches on him? He looks like he's been in a thousand battles and can't be killed that easily. I mean, same with the Death Dread. Look how much better this looks when it's not a glowing disco ball. I feel so sorry for the artist that did so much work, but with all the flashing lights of effects, you don't see how good they looked. I mean, granted these were cinematics, but why did they not at least try to give some battle damage on units? There are so many pictures I've seen of what Dawn of War 3 assets could have looked like, but I will leave a link to the Dawn of War 3 art station as some of those pictures there are really worth checking out. Look at this picture of Dawn of War 2. You see the grim dark colours and the effects standing out with brighter colours to indicate things to the player. Now here's a side by side picture of Dawn of War 3's Wraith Knight. The picture on the left, I reduced the saturation and brightness just by a little to show the difference it makes. I know it's not going to save the game, but already it gives more of a grim dark feeling. But talking about effects. What the hell is going on? Now look, effects can look great in games, but Dawn of War 3, I just felt like it was impossible to keep track of the battle and my units. Everything in the game was glowing, and the parts that were meant to glow gave you seizures just looking at them. Obviously when your match first starts, it's small firefights, and you can definitely keep track of your units, but when it gets to the late game, the amount of effects on screen really ruins the experience of seeing what's fighting what. And instead, in the grim dark future, there is only disco balls and bling. <laughs> My sweet Gorguts, look what they did to you. Don't worry my child, they can no longer hurt you. You're in a better place. To be fair, they got a lot of the models right. I understand why Gorguts was made the way he was, obviously they did this for ability reasons, being able to swing his claws since in early concept art we could see that he had different weapons that did the same ability, but there were some design choices with the models in the game that I hated. Why when you upgrade a tactical marine squad does everyone get a plasma gun? There was something so cool in Dawn of War 1 and 2 that only one person got the upgrade. I mean that's one of the things I liked about the Death Watch in Dawn of War 3 was that only one guy got the rocket launcher or flamethrower. One theory I have for this game why the Space Marine legs were longer and obviously all guys in the Tactical Marine Squad got the upgrade is because I bet someone at Games Workshop told them to do this. The size ratio of the Space Marines in game look far more like Primaris Space Marine and with all of them having plasma guns it makes them far more look like a Hellblaster squad. It's almost as if Games Workshop were betting that this game would one day be a huge success so they could one day change the model's helmet in game to look more like a Primaris. Combine this with the fact that it was only one month after Dawn of War 3's release that 8th edition got released, showing off all the Primaris Space Marines, it seems intentional. 
Once again, the models did not look bad, but honestly, what made the models look worse were the abilities added to them, like Gorgots' grappling hook fucking, you know, swinging halfway across the map like a monkey. <laughs> or the Death Jet becoming a bloody drill. <laughs> It looks just so weird. And why was Gabe put in Tactical Dreadnought armor? I love this old design in Dawn of War 1 and 2. Buildings, however, clearly did not get their fair share of models. I mean, this is meant to be a base building game. You had the HQ, the barracks, the better barracks, the upgrade armory, the vehicle builder, and the listening post defender. Each faction might have different names or one or two different ones like the orcs with the wag banners, but where were the turrets and the mines? And why could I not upgrade my listening post to be bigger and better at defending? Some of my best hours in Dawn of War 1 were just being a little bitch and camping in the map, just making a huge defence that my enemy would have to try and push through. Even Dawn of War 2 with no base building let you build more defences than this game. And yes, I know turrets were added in an update, and technically speaking, you already had a turret with the one that you had to kill to attack the base. But don't worry, I'll be getting onto you very fucking soon. models are only as good as they are animated. Some of the animations in game were just ridiculous. Just to name a few, Gabe running made it look like he was not even wearing Terminator armour. In Dawn of War 2, the Terminators moved slow and this gave them a sense of weight behind them that they were a beast of a unit. I mean this can be applied to any Space Marine unit in the game. They all moved so fast. Compared to Dawn of War 1 and 2, it just didn't give this sense of like they were wearing armour. Gorguts and his walking claw just looked awkward. Yes, the Dawn of War 1 Gorguts looked funny, but I think it was acceptable back then. It just looks goofy now. I mean, I understand they were trying to make stuff look orky, but instead they just made it look handicapped. But I can let that slide. What I can't is sink kills. <laughs> I know some people were defending this, saying that it makes smoother gameplay and the models don't get stuck or get killed on retreat, but I don't think that justifies it enough. That's crazy. Sync kills were as part of Dawn of War's brand as Grim Dark is as well. You take the Dawn of War name off this game and fine, it's a great game, but Relic knew sync kills were part of their most valued traits in the Dawn of War franchise, so removing it just didn't sit right with many people. It also showed their passion for the game. The fact that Tao had melee animations in Dawn of War 1 speaks volumes of how much they cared. The best way I feel I can put this into perspective is imagine Total War Warhammer 3 or Space Marine 2 coming out with no sync kills and then they said it was because it made the game flow better. It would be truly upsetting and that's how people felt when Dawn of War 3 came out. Coil and in contrast with each other. We talked about the soul lane dominance uh, or the soul lane importance, but we've also talked about Fnatic's ability to affect those soul lanes with anyone other than those two players individually. Get the fuck out of my RTS. What the fuck? Welcome to Dawn of War 3. Take a order, please. What's the big idea putting your sh Dawn of War 3 next to my shitty Dawn of War? I'm sorry, I do not understand your accent. You want to sh Dawn of War 3? No, I don't want shitty Dawn of War 3. I want you to go find another shitty town, open your Dawn of War 3. This is what doomed Dawn of War 3. They had a choice Annihilation or Victory Point Control. Instead, they thought, hey, how can we get more money? Oh, I know, let's try to get the RTS fans and the MOBA fans. If we give the RTS fans their big armies and base building, but combine that with the lanes and defense towers of MOBA fans, we will get both. Wrong, you get none. If the reason for having the shield generator, sentry and power cores to stop rushes, then just have them in the base. When you set up lanes and create areas people have to go fight, then you don't allow for rush builds, flanking, base building in other spots. Now, I will say, we live in a day where remakes, remasters and copycat games are remade every year, like Battle Royale and First Person Shooters. No one tries anything new, so I have to openly acknowledge that Reddit tried to do something different, which is very rare these days in the game industry. 
and if this was the 8th Dawn of War game, then taking it in a new MOBA direction might be acceptable. But this was only the third installment of your IP. You still had many other areas to explore with content before needing to create new core mechanics. You should have expanded in the third game on areas people wanted more of instead of focusing your resources on creating an unwanted game mode. The best part of Dawn of War was having a second base to fall back on. The way Dawn of War 3 was designed, you might as well just had one building that did everything. Setting up defences was the whole part of Dawn of War 1's base building, and launching with one game mode. Are you mad? Dawn of War 1 launched with more, and that was in 2004. I mean, come on, you could have at least made every shield gen and sentry gun to match the faction you're playing as, or made the map far bigger. But of course, you could not build headquarters till the Annihilation update, so there was no point. At least when you launched the game, you should have had two game modes. Even if your MOBA game mode was really successful, Dawn of War 1 showed you that people love Annihilation mode, so why wasn't it there from the start? Or what about Last Stand, one of your most successful game modes in the whole of Dawn of War? I mean, you had so many elites to choose from in Dawn of War 3 that you could have had as playable characters. And this is one of the game modes where using all of the units from an army fighting one character with all the explosions and flashing lights would have actually fitted quite well. That's crazy. There's just so many missed opportunities with Dawn of War 3 that really makes it a disappointment. Fiery skies shall light the way. And blood shall spill over the wandering world. The spear of Cain shall call the wayfarers, and the storm prince shall unite them. Their victory shall shake the heavens. Honestly, the cinematics did not bother me. They actually looked really good. What I hated though was it teasing you the entire time with a more grim dark looking game and I was like, where's this game? I want to play that, not this. The campaign is broken into two parts, the story and the missions. The basis of the story is that there's a weapon known as the Spear of Cain on this planet. The three races try to get to the spear and it results in them releasing a demon. They have to team up to kill it. Obviously there's more detail but the story itself is not bad, it's just not amazing. However, one problem I did have was the sort of Avengers team up at the end with the three races, you know, with Eldar, Space Marine and Orcs working together. It just felt so odd. I mean, I know this happens in the lore, but it's so, so rare. And Gorguts, the biggest of all Orcs, working with other races just did not sit right with me. But our concern is the leader. He is here and we must destroy him. Are we? You mean us? As a team, the Wayfarers must unite. Sod off! What would have been a great twist is that after the demon was killed, then suddenly a whole Necron army is awakened beneath the surface of the planet which turns out to be a tomb world, and you play as the Necrons attacking all three of the other races. The missions for Dawn of War 3 is what ruined the campaign for me. I mean, I could go into more detail into each one, but I'm not. The main problems first of all was base building being used so little. I felt like I was barely building bases when playing. Once again, it might have well as just been a Dawn of War 2 style base where it did everything. But the last mission really gritted my teeth for two reasons. First of all, you gave us three characters to play as. This is an RTS. I don't want to fight a demon with three heroes. I want to attack a demon with the might of the Astartes, with predators, knights and space marines, not this trio of characters. And the thing that really put this into perspective for me was the demon. It's a beautiful model, probably the most grim dark thing in the entire game, and it was just left to rot in a mission forever. This is why it's so crucial to have a fourth race as the final boss, so you're not wasting amazing assets like this. And all the fucking teasers of the Necron environments was such a piss take. You might as well have just made it any fucking environment. I do know I'm ranting at this point and I feel bad for doing it, but going back and playing Dawn of War 3 really made me think of what this game could have been. People getting annoyed about the game modes were one thing, but if you don't have balanced and meaningful game mechanics, your game is doomed. I mean, where do I start on this? How about the elites? You say these are Dawn of War 2 heroes we wanted. 
No, these are broken MOBA heroes you can't kill. Unless you take all three of your elites for the early game, you are going to lose. Your opponent would just have a more powerful army than you and snowball you to death. And it would take far too long to get the better elites out, so you would have to take the cheaper ones to stay in the game. Dawn of War 2 heroes, whilst powerful, could be countered and they had to respect certain units, otherwise they would kill them very quickly. I mean, I won't lie, if this game launched with Annihilation Mode and similar Dawn of War 1 base building with turrets and defences, but with the heroes of Dawn of War 2 that don't mess up the early game, then I think it would have done a lot better. And the cover system, why did you go backwards? The cover system in Dawn of War 2 was brilliant. I mean, who were you trying to please with this one? Dawn of War 2 fans liked their cover system, and Dawn of War 1 fans did not really care. So making it a bubble, a bloody bubble, was diabolical. And don't forget, it was broken. Some of these bubbles were at midpoints on the map, and whichever player got there first gave them a huge advantage. Stand firm! No mercy, no respite! Charge! The game modes and game mechanics are where Dawn of War 3 screwed up the most. Because all the other things I've mentioned in this video, be that art, sound, effects, models, advertisement, even sync kills, you can still play the game of Dawn of War, as long as they don't change the core of the game of being an RTS science fiction game. However, when they changed what Dawn of War was at its very core mechanics, that was the last part of it taken away, and all that was left was the Warhammer IP in this strange game with the name of a loved franchise. But, unbeknownst to them, others have become aware of their exploits. <laughs> Let me say this first, launching with three races in an RTS is not unheard of, and each race in Dawn of War 3 did have fleshed out rosters, but you don't do this when your previous instalments always had four. Even if three races had more content than four, psychologically this makes the buyer think they are paying more for less, and in a time when the game industry is looking to milk as much money out of their customers as possible with microtransactions and loot boxes, you need to ensure your game has enough content on launch to justify doing that. The biggest problem I have with this is the tease of the Necrons. Let me explain. When you tease a new race for a game, you are basically saying that this is going to be coming to the game at some point. The fact that Necrons did not come as DLC proves that the only thing they were interested in was how well the game was selling. They had no intention of trying to save the game or push a big rework or patch to bring people back. In a livestream they were even asking people what races they would like to see and I bet you one of those artists for this game has concept art of the Necrons somewhere. Yes, they did try to save the game with patches, adding skins and maps here, and annihilation mode there, but that's just panicking and throwing stuff around hoping that it will do something. <laughs> They should have instead been mature about the situation and said, We understand some people are upset with the current state of the game. We are going to focus our resources on the next few months on a rework including a new race, annihilation and victory point mode, and a reworked elite mechanics. If after that then the community still gave you shit, then fine, we're not the ones who deserve it. But we've seen that gamers respect developers and publishers who put money into their games to salvage the situation like No Man's Sky and Sea of Thieves. This brings me on to one of the reasons why I made this video in the first place. Did we kill Dawn of War 3? One side you can easily say, well, no players, no new content. Fair enough. This video was going to be called We Killed Dawn of War 3. But after doing a lot more research and reflection making this video, I felt that it was not our fault we didn't like this game, because there was very little we liked about it that was similar to previous versions. I will admit, as much as I disliked Dawn of War 3, I wished I had supported it more. Regardless of Dawn of War 3's faults, it was a Warhammer 40k game, and those come so, so rare these days. And I would have liked to have seen what Dawn of War 3 would have been like if we gave it a chance, and seen what Necrons and Tyranids and Tau added with reworks and changes would have been liked. But Sega were the ones who pulled the plug. If they're not going to give it a chance, then how can we? But this brings me on to the main reason I made this 30 minute long video. Dawn of War 3 has good attributes as well. I know I have not gone into full detail about what they were, some missions were better than others, the fleshed out rosters of armies, super heavy units, 
the music, the hard work put in by animators, 3D modelers, voice actors, sound designers, etc. There are many more things I could have talked about, but I want Reddit to remember these things. As the reason I made this video is because I felt like it had to be made because there is a video I have been wanting to make since Dawn of War 3 failed. And now after completing this, I feel I can finally move on to making it. Crazy.